Turn to 1 John chapter 3. There at the end of your Bible, you have um, the book of Revelation. And it, and if you just hit that book at the very end and back up a few pages, you'll see 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Go to 1 John. 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on, upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Bless these verses. Bless our time together. Uh, God, just thank you for all your goodness to us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your graciousness. God, thank you for this place to meet. Lord, thank you for the birth of your son. We will soon be celebrating that. God, we thank you for all the hard work that has been poured into the uh, program and the parents, Lord, and their their help with transporting their young people back and forth. And God, just so many things. Thank you, Lord, that uh, Mary's baby was born healthy and well. Lord, uh, we know Johnny and Lisa have a baby coming in the next few weeks. And, and Lord, there are others. Lord, we pray that you'd bless this morning. We pray that you'd meet the needs. We pray that you'd speak to folks' hearts. God, may people hear something from thee this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. He says, Behold, what manner of love. Behold. Behold always means, you know, you get used to certain words, but it means uh, to gaze. Uh, it means to look at this. It means to consider it. It means to pause. You know, in the book of 1 John, you have five chapters. And uh, man, the, the book of 1 John is packed. It's got things uh, regarding uh, the prophecy at the end. It's got uh, things regarding doctrine and, and all sorts of things. And you have chapters 1 and 2, and then you have chapters 4 and 5. And right in the middle, he says, stop and take a look at the love of God. Um. In chapter 1, verse 5, you're right there. We have uh, one of the most amazing statements about God. In chapter 1, verse 5, it says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And John opens the book, and first he tells you who he is. And when you see who he is, then you begin to understand his love Amen. more rightly. You know, uh, you, he, he wants you to see his love in view of himself and not in view of the way we see love. God's love is vast and it is huge and it is much, much bigger than ours. And uh, wouldn't you agree? And of course, uh, all the church folks, you know, we, we would all agree with that statement. And yet, and yet, Though God's love is so huge and so vast, one person described it as a shoreless, bottomless sea. It's just you, you can never get to the bottom of it. You can't see to the far end of it. And though that be true, he is the one that draws black and white lines in the sand. He talks about his son. He talks about sin in this book, in these five chapters. He has a lot to say about the world. And he has a lot to say about how to identify the people that really know him. And so often when we uh, begin to approach those black and white zones, um, the world then turns the tables on us and says we are unloving. But he is the one who has the greatest love ever, and he is the one that drew these lines. The conclusion that you have to come to is this, that much of Christianity really knows very little about their God, and they do not understand his love. Behold, he says, and then he says, what manner of love? Take a look at the kind of love that he has. You know, we sing a lot of songs about his love. Um, one of the verses to, 
one of the songs we sing says, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Another verse says, Tis mystery all, the immortal dies. Who can explain his strange design? In vain, the firstborn seraph tries to sound the depths of love divine. You know, the Bible describes us before we were saved in a lot of different ways. A lot of adjectives the Lord uses. He calls us lost. He calls us dead in trespasses and sins. He calls us polluted. He calls us enemies. He calls us sinners. He calls us strangers. He calls us the children of wrath and many other things. And none of those things uh, have any positive connotation. You know how we are. We love what is attractive. And we love things that show appreciation. And we love things that respond to us. And we love things that are considerate and thoughtful. And we love people that recognize all our good qualities. But we were none of these towards God. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Is there any love like his? You know, he could have loved us like a distant relative. You know, you love your great aunt Martha that you never see. He could have loved us like a charity project. You know, somebody you see and, you know, you see him on the street and your heart goes out to them and you feel pity and you feel sentimental, but there's nothing deep about that. You're, you're not going to, you're not going to plunge and invest real deep in that one. He could have loved us like a leader loves his countrymen, like a leader loves his nation. You know, there have been some great leaders through history and they loved their nation, but but their love was not an individual thing. It was just toward a mass of people. And all their countrymen were was just a face in the crowd. That's a distant love. But God's love towards you and me is not that at all. It is not a distant love. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Keep your place there and look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139. You know, when you read these verses, one of the things you discover is um, how very involved that God is involved, uh, how, how very involved God is with his people and um, with everybody. Uh, you know, Mary just had a baby and... Um, uh, Lisa's going to soon have a baby and and uh, my daughter Charity soon going to have a baby and babies are coming. And, you know, you know, a lot of you mothers in here, uh, I think many of you, um, especially with your first baby, you uh, you may have a baby book. And, you know, in that baby book, you know, there's a picture and there's all the information and they used to do this. I don't know that they still do, but there would be a, a little imprint of the baby's foot and and. And, you know, that that book would sort of be the beginning of tracing that life. And I came across some stuff in a box that my mom had. And uh, it was just my sister and I. I didn't grow up in a big family. And mom had a book like that. And she had a book and it went all the way through. And as we started school and it had our grade cards in it and and a picture of each year. And and, you know, you know what that is? That's that's a mother's love. Um. But look what the Lord says about us in Psalm 139, verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins. 
thou, he's talking about God, has covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And he's describing there your mother's womb. And you see that in the next verse. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, God's baby book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Your members, that's, you know, that's your, your hands and your feet and your, your fingers and your toes. And he says, in this book, all your members were written, which in continuance were fashioned. He said, you were made according to what I wrote in that book. But he said, it was, it was before any of those things actually came to be. Verse 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Look at Psalm chapter 40. Psalm chapter 40. His love and his interest in your life is not distant. It is very, very intimate. And it has been since before you were born. Psalm 40, verse 16. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. You know, I, I'm sure the Lord had a lot on his mind this morning, you know, and he was, he, uh, he never sleeps. He that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. And, and uh, the darkness and the light are both alike to him. And he never grows weary. And uh, this morning, you know, where some of his thoughts were, uh, they were on you. They were on you this morning. Look at Luke 12, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke 12. Luke 12, verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. That that price is so small. And what it's saying there, you know, those those birds were just almost worthless. And it's interesting because God noticed them. He noticed the going price. He said, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And he said, yet not even one of them is forgotten. And then he continues in verse seven. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. And then he says, what manner of love is it that we should be called the sons of God? His love toward us is the love of a father for his son or for his child. And, you know, the Lord is the, the best father ever. You know, um, you know, some of you were blessed with good fathers and, and you know, they, they, they weren't all saved. You know, some of you, you grew up in a lost home and yet your father cared about you. And, you know, uh, he, he took, he paid the bills and he kept food on the table. And, and, uh, you know, sure, certainly he wasn't perfect and no father is, but um, you, had a, you had a good father. Tried to instill some good things in you. Tried to keep you from making a wreck of your life. But you know, not everybody has a good father. Um, 
a lot of homes that the fathers are, you know, it's, it's just the children grow up and with a lot of regrets and they, they grow up with a lot of hurts and they wish it were different, but God is the best father ever. There's no darkness with him. There's no agenda with him. There's no, uh, there's no bad days with him. There's no neglect with him. There's nothing he will ever forget. Look at Luke 15. You're in chapter 12. Look at Luke 15. His love for us is the love of a perfect father toward his son. But none of his sons are perfect except the Lord Jesus. It's the love of a perfect father toward a son that is not perfect. Look at Luke 15, verse 11. And you'll recognize this, this story. And in this parable that the Lord tells, the father is a picture of himself. Luke 15, verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. In other words, he just took all the money that was his inheritance and he partied it away. Verse 14. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. He was so desperate, he was just about to eat the hog food. That's pretty desperate. Any of you have, any of you ever fed hogs? Raise your hand. Any of you, and Chris, so you've been in a hog pen. You understand what that is. That's just pure nasty. He reached a state where he was going to eat the pig food. Verse 16. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in, in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. And man, the father jumps right in there didn't even let him finish his speech. Verse 22. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. 
But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meat, means it was fitting. It was just right. That we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. You know, God is the father in this picture and, and his adult sons. And um, you see his, his way of dealing with both the wayward son and the angry son. You know, God has both. God has some wayward sons, you know, that, man, they, they served the Lord at one time. And, and you know, they, uh, they, they just got away from the Lord. And, you know, like it says about Demas, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And he went out into the world. And then he has some other sons that they're just angry. They're just angry with the way things have turned out. And they just think God's unfair about the way he does things. But you know what this father does? He, uh, he loves them both. He reasons with them. When that one son comes back, he doesn't throw his past in his face. He's not always reminding him. He's not, he's not uh, making him always feel like he's horribly disappointed. He is glad that his son is home. And the past is left in the past. That's the way the father loves his sons. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. He loves us. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Hebrews 12. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. Hebrews 12, verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For the Lord loveth, excuse me, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth, notice the wording, every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. He says, if you don't, uh, he says, if you don't have that chastisement thing, if you can't identify with that, he says, you're not really one of his sons. He says, something else has occurred. You've, mis you've made a mistake somewhere. And he says that whom he loveth, he chasteneth, he dealeth with us as with sons. You know, um, a father chastens his children. It says in Proverbs, he that loveth his son chasteneth him betimes. And, uh, you know, many of you know what that was like, and hopefully it was done properly at your house. But the whole thought was, you know, and we've been talking a lot about this on Wednesday evenings, you know, that that thing of the need to um, chasten a child. And, um, you know, and our, our world has has uh, gotten to the place where they they term that abuse. And, and boy, just all the lines have got, gotten blurred. Everything's all murky and muddy. Everything used to be really clear. Certainly there is such a thing as abuse. But but, you know, when you go to the Bible, it talks about chastening. And God says, this is to be done. There is a right way to do it. It is the mark of how a father and a mother deal with their children. They don't deal with other children, but they deal with their own. And for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? And it's part of that correction process. You know, if you're a, if you're a believer, you know, and you know, you got saved, you know, I will say five years ago, one of the things you learn about the Lord as you walk with him is, he cares about you. He really does. Um, if I saw one of you after church today and you had your three little ones and uh, two of them are dodging cars in the parking lot and the third one is running back and forth across the highway trying to dodge cars. 
And I look at you and I say, um, your, your kids run, help them. And you say, oh, they're okay. And I say, hello, they're okay. Maybe you didn't understand they're in the traffic. And he says, oh, he says, that's okay. If they get run over, that'll teach them a lesson. What would you say? You know, the conclusion that you would draw is they don't care about their children. You know, the mark of a father's care is that um, he instructs and he loves and he provides. He does all that. But he steps into their world very intimately, very specifically. He's invasive. The mother is invasive. I mean, you know. They're stopping you. One of the first words every child learns is no. Why is that? Because there must be that restraint. And you know what the Lord does as a believer? You know, you get saved and you begin to walk with the Lord. And all I can say is if you're saved, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. And if you're not saved, you will not understand. But there are times when you start drifting from the Lord, you start playing with something you shouldn't be playing with. You start leaning. You start hiding something. You start rejecting the Lord's voice. And all of a sudden, God steps into your world. Your finances go awry. Somebody turns against you. Something falls, you know, some, something you were counting on. Suddenly it doesn't come through. There's new stress from another angle. You get a bad phone call. And all of a sudden, you realize, you're thinking, what is going on? And instantly, you know what's going on. And you're going, Lord, I know what you're doing. I know this is my fault. Everything was fine until I started doing this. Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I'll get this right. And it stops. And as a child of God, you will experience that over and over and over. Do you know why that is? He chastened every son. Why? He loves his children. He wants the best. He wants to save them from heartache and suffering and disastrous decisions and judgment. And you know what he does? He, he's invasive. You know why? Because as a believer, he's your father. It's the love of a father for a son. That love is a deep, piercing, yearning affection. You don't have to turn there, but in First, uh, Second Samuel 18, you find the story of, um, of David and his son Absalom is murdered. And when he gets the news that Absalom is murdered, it is one of the most heartrending verses in the Bible. I, some of you have the Bible on, uh, on you know, CD or on your phone, where somebody reads it audibly. And one of the one of the best readers is a guy named Alexander Scurvy, and he's a British reader. And he actually got saved. He was a professional reader and actor in England, and and uh, his reading of the Bible is just phenomenal. He recorded it through several times. And in the midst of that, surprise, surprise, he got saved. And um, he comes to that passage. And you can hear the heartbreak as David says, Absalom, my son, my son, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And that's a, that's a man. Do you know how much God loves you? Absalom, David's son perished. He would never get him back. He would never see him again. Not in this life or the next. God so loved the world, so loved, so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish. You know, one thing you're going to understand on the other side, we're, heaven's going to be full of surprises. Like it's going to be loaded with surprises. Some of them as a believer, they're going to be absolutely. And I, I, I in the big context, it's going to be just amazing. Like I, you, 
I feel stupid even saying that because I, I can't think of a word. I could come up with a bunch of adjectives. But you know what's going to happen is, as a believer, you're going to step on the other side, and it's going to take your breath away for a long time. For a long time. But you know one thing that will be surprising? Is the people that you thought were going to be there that won't be there. And I don't know who you are this morning. Uh, in every crowd, in every crowd, you've got some people. Every crowd. We've got some people in this room that would say they're believers. And eternity will reveal that they are not the sons of God. And man, you've got us fooled. You really do. And we love you. And I, I would, honest to God, I would kiss your feet and give you all the money in my wallet if you turn to Jesus Christ. I would. And I'm not the only one. We There's a bunch of us in here. We'd line up to kiss your feet and plead with you, we would. But God did something better. He sent his son to die for you. And you know what you're going to find out on that final day where the lost are judged? You know, your life will be reviewed and all that stuff. And he's going to look at you and just say, depart from me. And you know what you're going to recognize in that moment? The Bible says all judgment has been committed unto the son unto Jesus Christ. He will be the judge on that great white throne, the one who died for you. And the last thing you'll see before you're cast into the flames of eternal darkness, you'll see the pierced hands. And you know what you'll know forever? He loved you. You might not like us. You might, you might, some of us, God forbid that some of us are your excuse for not being saved, but maybe, maybe that's true. But you know what? He's the best father ever. On that day, you won't look at us. You'll see those nail pierced hands. Behold what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us. That we, wretched sinners, that, that we should be called the sons of God. Christian, it might be dark in your world this morning, but if you're saved, you got something you can thank Him for. And in the midst of your darkness, and in the midst of Monday morning, tomorrow, and the bills and the problems, He loves you, and He loves you just as much as the day His Son died. It'll never wane, it'll never go away. And he loves you like a father loves his son. Nobody may care for you, but he does. The songwriter said, the songwriter, Charlie Weigel, the night he was going to commit suicide, his wife had left him. He had gotten saved and he loved the Lord. and He was trying to follow the Lord and he was a good man. And his wife has just looked at him one day and said, man, if you're going to do this Christianity business, I'm out of here. And she left, and it broke his heart. He had loved her. He had spoiled her. He had been good to her. He had prayed for her. Man, she said, I'm done. I'm out of here. And he said, that night, he said, I really lost my faith. He said, I, I walked out to a bridge, and I was going to jump. And he said, somewhere on that bridge, he said, somehow, as only God can do, he communicated to me once again how much he loved me. And then he said, I thought, God, I can't do this. I can't do this to you. And he went home and wrote the song, No One Ever Cared for Me Like Jesus. Christian, what manner of love is yours? Let's pray. Father, help us. Let us. Lord, would you let us feel it just a little? Lord, we, we must take it by faith. And yet, Lord, as we look at these things. Lord, it begins to dawn on us how much you've loved us. And God, we won't understand till we get there. But hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Now, Lord, we are the most loved people. God, would you help us that we just be conscious of your love in this dark, discouraging, loveless world. And God, help those in this room that do not know thee. 
Lord, may it dawn on them that they are not truly thy sons. Lord, may they realize that in this very moment they could turn to you and call on your name and embrace you and your son. Lord, you've made it easy for all mankind because you so loved us. God, let it be real. And God, help us, Lord, that the electronics and the busyness of today and the tiredness of tomorrow morning, Lord, that it won't take that away. Lord, would you let us wake up in the morning and just, just remind us again, Lord, what manner of love you have bestowed upon us. And Lord, would you help us that we would just stand in awe that you have loved us in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, whatever God said to you this morning, why don't you talk to him? Father, thank you, Lord, that you loved us. And thank you that you loved us this morning. Thank you, Lord, you're thinking about us this morning. God, later today, you'll still be thinking about us, Lord, because you care. And God, thank you, Lord, for your love. Help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you're dismissed. And again, remember, uh, we need to have a brief meeting with everybody involved in the program tonight. They're in the back room. Thank you. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you.